Welcome to this week's Treasury Career Corner podcast, where I interview treasury professionals about their treasury careers. Each and every week, I talk to treasurers about how they've built their careers, where they are now, and where they see both themselves and the treasury profession going to next. In this week's show, I'm joined by Julie Fabris, the treasurer at Britax Childcare Group Limited. Now, for those of you who don't know, Britax is a British manufacturer of childcare products, car seats, push chairs, high chairs, and automotive safety equipment. For many, many years, throughout the 70s, they you know grew and grew and grew, headquartered in the UK, but they've got divisions based across the world. And later on, we'll get Julie to explain exactly how Britax runs and everything else, because you know, a really interesting interesting business as well. But Julie herself, many, many years experience, which is great, an active member of the ACT, uh, the UK Association of Treasurers. So she works, you know, does panel discussions, joins in, really great networker. She was also pleased to say on our Bounce Back program where we help treasurers, you know, improve their profiles and stuff like that. Was, she was wonderful on it. Thank you, Julie. Let's start your career. So you, well, training accountant and Menzies. So you first ever thought, oh, do my levels, do my levels. I want to be an accountant. How did it all start? Yeah. Take me back. Well, I know. Well, it goes back to obviously um, the school and what I wanted to do with my life when I left. I was good arithmetically. I did some work experience at a retail bank, a local branch. And yeah. uh, I must say that after a week there, I decided that retail banking probably wasn't going to be for me for one way or the other. So I then, you know, chose the accountancy route, wanted to become an accountant and had some very good advice from a teacher at school that says, you know, I was going to go for this the, the sort of lower profession rather than the elite chartered accountancy route. And she said to me, why? Why don't you just aim high? And then what's the worst can happen? So that's what I did. So I was very successfully trained as a chartered accountant. And it went from there because after I got my chartered accountancy, went around a few uh, audits en route and thought, actually, I don't want to stay in the profession. I'd like to go out into industry and into working for companies. Thought that a small family-sized business where I could fit in and uh, with the people and help them uh, would be great. Then I got the call saying, well, how would you like to be treasury accountant for Redland? And Redland at the time, Redland PLC was in the, it was about number 52 in the FTSE 100. And I thought to myself, hmm, they're not that small. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, they said, well, the treasury team, the treasury team's small, so go along and have a chat. Really, that's where it took it took off because I was just so excited and so interested in the work that Treasury encompassed that uh, I really never looked back from there. So I started off as the uh, treasury accountant. So I was going to say, for people that don't know, maybe explain what Redland do and how that then impacted on you know the work you did in Treasury. Yeah, what was their sort of, you know. Well, they were a multinational uh, building materials company. I mean, their annual turnover was around two and a half billion. They had operations globally at the U- uh, UK, US, Europe and the Far East. And its UK head offices were in London. I had a treasury team of about half a dozen people at the time. And that helped me because I really lent on the treasury people to learn the skills because I came in as an accountant looking at an interest rate swap and thinking, how do you do a mark to market value on that? (laughs) How does that work? You know, it was really kind of, the the team there were quite, it was, the team there were quite elite in terms of they, they, they were pioneering at the forefront of the swaps market at the time and other sort of financial instruments. Within three months of joining, Redland did a hostile takeover of another PLC company, that's in the FTSE 250, and then six years later uh, became, um, you know, was defending a hostile takeover by Lafarge, the French building materials materials company, which they uh, was unsuccessful, unfortunately. So during my time there, I got to see at the head office in the treasury and the finance function, the sort of like the, the, the big picture of, of companies and the strategies and as well as sort of learning my treasury skills took my association of corporate treasury did a little bit of work abroad as well you know there were different cultures within the organization as well which i found fascinating just diverting off for a moment you say about doing the act exams so that was really in the earlier days of the act exams now they're much more well established right. you know 20 years you know what, what was it like then what were they were they just here's the exam off you go and stuff like that 
No, no, not at all. I mean, I, I, I gained a couple of exemptions from being a chartered accountant, looking at the corporate finance. And one story I've got, I went along to the lecture hall. Uh, the lecturer sort of had a set of accounts up on the board. And he said, right, I want you to have a look at the ratios of this balance sheet, you know, and tell me what the, you know, what you think the value of the company is. And so we all worked out, you know, debtors days and all this kind of stuff on sort of their balance sheet. And what he did, he took a big back marker and he goes, right, can we just scrawled across a lot of it and he said that's so wrong he said that's horrible historical cost accounting he said that tells you nothing about the future value of the company or very little (laughs) yes and that was kind of wow and again another big moment for me is is where treasury is at it's it's looking at the future of course they're quite tough the exams though no but it's they are not (laughs) <laughs> but they're very good. I'm, I'm not. I'm not a natural exam taker either. So yeah. If you want to progress in treasury, then my one do. advice is that you you need them. Yeah. Yes, yeah, through that. So you did that, and then you were at Redland, your treasury manager, and then you moved on. What happened? I did. Well, completely different company. So this is a London, UK-based property company. Gained a large PLC, the fourth largest property company. It had assets over four billion on its balance sheet. And so a very different perspective. So there was a lot of capital markets activity. They had very long dated debt instruments with very long dated swaps against them. And a, a sort of, at that time, the sort of investment property world was changing. And MEPC wanted to develop a strategy whereby it sort of had business parks or owned business parks and, and almost managed the space for the business mm-hmm. parks for individual tenants and turning over those parks, sort of doing up the, the properties and then renting them out and, and having that sort of like t- turnover of, of tenants and building the parks and very successful at doing that, I have to say. So in my time there, we had a lot of bilateral bank facilities, which we renegotiated. And then I was very fortunate to go into the capital markets world and raised the Euro medium term note program, started off at a billion euros and then went to two billion. And at that time, we could source some very cheap money from Japan. It was a time when a lot of the Japanese investors were in the market and crazy, crazy money because on the swap, we'd, we'd do a currency swap on the back of that. So you'd have an all in sterling funding cost of some really low rate. So it worked very well for us and the medium term note program because it's, it's kind of investor driven rather than you going to the market and saying, I want to raise, I want to raise half a billion you wait and the investors are there and they say, well, actually, I want to invest in 50 million, you know, 20 million or whatever. And so uh, so that was really interesting. And then what happened was the company itself was taken private and then it basically meant that there was less capital markets activity to do and, and the Treasury Department itself was no longer really needed. It got swallowed up by the sort of like the, the, the funds that, that bought the companies. So then I was made redundant. And then you took some time out and also lectured for coming back into Treasury. Yeah, that was quite strange. Again, through somebody I knew who was leaving, was halfway through doing a sort of schema course for, for adult students and said, well, we need someone to fill in. And it was an evening role. So I was on maternity leave looking after girls. So I did that. And what that taught me was whilst it's probably a very rewarding career for most, it, it wasn't really something that I wanted to progress. Great experience again, though. I feel nothing ventured, nothing gained in life sometimes. Yeah. That was good. And then you joined, well, we were just talking before the show, I, you know, my first ever school job, if you like, was at, was at Woolworths. And I said, I'm, you know, scarred by the turquoise and bright orange tie that you had to wear and, and everything else. But, but you joined it a few years later <laughs> and you were the group treasurer of Woolworths. What was that like? <laughs> I joined it, fortunately, at the last stages of Woolworth's existence, really. That was very interesting because as I was joining, it was September 2007, and they just completed an asset-backed lending facility, which was a great funding facility for a retail company as you can imagine all of the stock is, is bought in preparation for the Christmas trading period. A lot of it was very seasonal. And therefore, having having sort of money lent against 
your stock as it builds up, then sort of like works from a timing perspective. So the facility was great. Unfortunately, the markets weren't. The high street was not. Yeah. And, you know, it, it became a casualty. It had. It also had a logistics arm called Entertainment UK at the time, which was applying uh, games and, and the videos, etc., to Woolworths as well as other stores. And the credit insurers as well at that time were also getting hit and running for the hills a little bit. And all that put pressure on cash. So my... My real role at Woolworths was aside from sort of bedding down the new facility and how it operated and worked was cash management. It was cash forecasting. It was liquidity. Cash, cash. It was, and it became more and more detailed as things got more and more difficult. And and at, at that time, what I learned, I mean, I learned an awful lot from this experience. I have to say, not something that you'd want to particularly repeat, but <laughs> some things you, you just become a little bit more resilient and learn as a treasurer where your role and responsibility ends and where it starts and where it ends. And I think it's important to make the board aware of that and your boss is this CFO or whatever aware of that because you are propelled into a spotlight situation when everyone is fighting, when everyone wants cash. Um, so it was a really interesting time. And um, like I say, not, not something I want to repeat, but a good experience, really good experience. And you then moved on and joined Igloo Foods, who became Nomad, but you know they were private equity owned. And you, you talked there about cash, and everyone sort of says to me a lot of the time, oh, private equity, just about cash, 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 cash. Where's the cash? Bring it out. Blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I want clarity. Cash clarity, great. You know, that's what a treasurer does. But was yeah. it like that? Or, you know, how, how did you then, you left all worse and joined this new group. What, what were they like? Well, it was really interesting because after sort of, I suppose, yes, I joined in, in February, so I had two months off where I was kind of recovering from Woolworths, if you like. Went for an interview for Bird's Eye. So it's Bird's Eye, the frozen food group that everyone knows in the UK, um, Igloo Foods in Europe. And whilst it's private equity and everyone thinks of private equity as being a highly geared company, they did have lots of cash. And that was the one thing that I was sort of sighing a relief for. I was thinking, crikey, I'd like to work for an organisation that actually you know, is able to use cash. So that was great. But having said that, it's private equity, a world of which I'd never been in before. And, and it was, again, really interesting. It's so dynamically different from um, a PLC organization, is what I found anyway. And it took a little while for me to get used to the ways of working in private equity. It is different. And it's different in terms of the decision making, in terms of the board makeup, in terms of the focus. You know, with a PLC company, it's sort of bottom line. With private equity, equity. It's about EBITDA multiples and cash. But, you know, you can make real differences within private equity. The decision making is very quick. So, yes, whilst focus was on cash, they did have cash. And we did some several sort of refinancings, recapitalization, acquisition of the Findex Italy group as well. So there was lots going on within Treasury. You know, there's a lot of debt to manage and FX as well. So within that time, I was able to also hook up with the supply chain and purchase managers for example, and trying to get a more efficient way of understanding their FX exposures, something they hadn't looked at before. And I thought, well, actually, you know, we need to set a policy so that we do proper risk management here and that everyone understands. And so sort of presented a few board papers on it. Awesome. And with that, so just I want to go back onto that private equity thing. How does the relationship work, you know, with you as a treasurer? Is it that you, because... I've, I've had mixed reports. I'm not specifically focusing on your private equity fund and stuff like that, but is it that you just describe the, the relationship and how it was as a treasurer? How did you feel? Well, I think you have to very much get the fact that in private equity, the treasurer is in a slightly different, has a slightly different perspective, I think. It's yeah. very much a case of you have to roll your sleeves up. There's no hiding under any rocks. <laughs> private equity run a very lean finance function. In right. fact, I know you know quite a few private equity companies don't have treasurers, for example, because they have the, the CFO is accountable. And of course, the XP houses themselves are very finance orientated. So getting the sleeves rolled up and getting them to understand, well, what can you bring to the party? You know, what can you yeah. bring? Show them the risk that they have within the company. Are they hedging themselves outside or do they need your help in hedging? Or do they help need your help in the cash? Because cash is still key and a focus to them. So, you know, working capital management, finding liquidity solutions there. 
When it gets to the big refinancing and capitalisation, you'll find that the PE house will bring in their people to help you. But you can get involved as much as you like. I talk about quick decisions. We did a floating rate note. We issued a floating rate note in the market. We'd never done it before. Within 30 days from start to finish, we had to get the prospectus, the information memorandum prospectus out and everything. From start to finish, I remember having a call and they've actually brought the time forward rather than extended it for us. I mean, it was crazy. It was, yeah, 30 days, within 30 days from start to finish is quite something. And we got there and it was an achievement and it was great. So you do get help with the the higher end sort of funding and and financing. However, sort of within your day-to-day treasury job, it's very much up to you to kind of like, this is what, this is what I see risks are in the business and this is what we need to manage and, the, and very much put yourself there in front of your CFO and, and help them. To help them achieve and everything else and, and shine and everything yeah. else. So you did that till 2015 and then you joined Britex. How did that come about or what happened? I did. I mean, uh, it was five years and yeah. I think you mentioned at the start of the call, I've got a, quite a varied career. I think you sort of, you, you come in, you do your job, you get to a certain stage and then think to yourself, okay, right, what more can I add here? Or do I, am I looking for another new challenge? And I think with me, it was the latter. It's looking for another new challenge now. So I then became the treasurer for the that's Group where I am now. Mm. And that was exciting. They were a, they were a global manufacturer of car seats, like you said, um, and manufacturing-based company, PE-based as well. Location was good for me because it was out of London as well, with sort of youngish kids still. That was quite attractive. So again, we've done some interesting things there. We did the rebase the policy FX hedging strategy. And I've become much more involved in uh, the slightly smaller organization much more involved in the regional fd's activities and you know become you know a sort of support for them there and you know again on the purchasing side with suppliers we've got a huge supply chain out in china which you can imagine in the last six months has been quite interesting times <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> so we have a big china partner out there and also a supply chain finance solution something we put in place last year and then uh, unfortunately Britax uh, went through for some times its revenue wasn't coming through there was competition out there various other other reasons and it actually went through a restructuring recently a sort of debt for equity swap type arrangement now so yeah. we have new owners as of, as of the beginning of the year just so, team wise you've got some I know you've got some members of the team there yeah, it's quite a small team though at, at Britax and in private equity, like I say, you know, it was it's really sort of two of you. Mm. <laughs> it's very small and it's fine. I think with a bigger organisation, they 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 afford more treasury people. I think at private equity again, it's less so. But it is important that you know you you work well together, being a small team. Especially yes. with the with the rest of the finance team as well, with your tax, your you know, and your financial controllers. Yeah, I think, and, and there's a lot of people listening actually today that have a similar size teams. So it's I was just going to ask, how do you then you know sort of balance the activities? Is it that the other person is more day to day ops and you're sort of the biggest strategic stuff, or a mixture of both, or you just get stuck in, or you know, how do you run it? I mean, I suppose I end up sort of like with the higher level presentational stuff for the board, etc. And then the person helps me with a bit more of the day-to-day tasks, but we do muck in. We have to, from a cover perspective, I have to do yeah. everything they do. And, you know, what's, what's key is, 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 as you say, with a lot of treasurers that are in smaller teams and organizations, it can be pretty lonely. You know, you have your own language. Nobody else understands sometimes the things that you talk about, <laughs> 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 which is where the ACT comes in, especially for me anyway. Yeah. Yeah, it's sort of, it's, it's someone else to talk to, if that's the right way to put it. It's everything. I think, you know, it, it has the fundamentals of knowledge and understanding for its qualifications, but also regular up-to-date contacts via, you know, the webinars recently. No one can excuse themselves from not attending the webinar from home, you know, and, and support through a network, as well as the keeping up to date with all the regulation, especially, you mm-hmm. know, at times like now where we have lobbying with the governments around the support packages for companies i think the act is very much at the forefront of discussions with the bank of england and the government and keeping um, abreast of what's happening out there is also key 
And when you using that ACT sort of angle, if that's the right way, qualifications, you know, they've obviously supported you in your background and you are a contributor mm. to the ACT and everything else. How key mm. have you seen those? I know that when our first ever podcast years ago, a year, year and a half ago nearly, and it was Sarah Jane at GSK, she said, Mike, do every qualification you can because you never take away that bit of paper and she supported that in particular in treasury as well as well as you know sort of mbas and things you know she was she was agnostic about what it was but she actually you know very she's very pro act are you similar do you think you know that's something you should do you, you I, I like the bit where you talked about actually doing a accounting qualification versus treasury you know what are your thoughts around that yeah, I mean, it depends what you want to do. I mean, I did accountancy because I didn't really understand that Treasury was out there, to mm. be honest. A chartered accountant was a, was a well-established route for anyone with numbers that wanted to get a sort of professional qualification. And uh, like I said before, I'm, I'm, I'm like Sarah Jane, I'm not, I'm not a lover of taking exams. <laughs> In fact, Mike, I tried to get away with not doing the full Treasury <laughs> exams with the ACT. I thought with the AMCT qualification, I could probably just stay there maybe. But uh, it wasn't to be, I think, if you want to become a treasurer, you probably need, you need that piece of paper. You absolutely do. And having gone through and done the exams, I do understand why. I mean, it is a key skill and requirement if you want to be a treasurer. Yeah, I mean, getting as much qualifications as you can. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, to be honest. I mean, the ACT qualification itself is great and it stands out there for if, if you want to be a corporate treasurer. Would I do an MBA? Probably not, because I, I, I believe that, you know, there's experience as well that you learn when you're on the job. And you don't stop learning either. You don't stop learning. Every company I've joined, I've learned a lot from them. And the interesting thing about treasury and what I love about the corporate treasury is that the fundamental skills that you take with you from company to company, it doesn't matter what industry you're in. The fundamental skills are the same around risk management, cash flow forecasting, management, liquidity management, funding, etc. What's different is the cash flow drivers within each business, the strategy. Yeah. It's like, what does that business do? Where does it generate its cash? How does that interpret into it, into my forecast process? That's what's interesting. That's why, that's what sort of like, you know, gets me going. So I go across different industries and I think that's really key. Yeah, I mean, just to clarify, she, she wasn't sort of saying at the exception of all others. What, what she was saying is that when people came to me and said, oh, should I do an MBA? Should I do ACT? She was just pro-study. And, and depending on where you wanted, you know, you know, I get a phone call yeah. sometimes and people say, oh, should I do the ACT or should I do CTP? And I said, well, where are you going to work? And they're like, well, yeah. I might work in uh -huh. Europe or I might work in, you know, ACT is much more recognised and known in the UK because mm -hmm. lots of people have done it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you go to the Middle East and CTP is rapidly yeah. growing. You know, go, go to America, AMCT, they're like, what? CTP, yes. It's, it's just different. They're all great qualifications. So don't get me wrong and I'm not knocking it, but, you know, it's a different one. And taking that and sort of, and perhaps then looking towards the future, we've just come out of this or on the way out of this pandemic and everything else. I still see the, the cartoons, which I do love. And, you know, someone mentions Brexit. It's like, oh, thank goodness. You know, like new, new letters that we can go on about rather than COVID, COVID, COVID. Going back into Treasury and looking at the future of treasury you know what are the things coming up that you think treasurers need to plan for over the next 6 12 18 months two years is it right let's cope with the the crisis and that what that's done is it I don't know, maybe it's all of these you know is it brexit is it developing markets is it it what are the things that are on your mind as a treasurer a really interesting question because I think most treasurers have been rather busy of late sorting out state aid funding where they can, looking at their company's liquidity profile, getting through, as you say, this first initial phase. And what's interesting is what happens afterwards for me because I can I can see that perhaps boards and companies are going to develop a different strategy. And I think a corporate treasurer just it needs to adapt to the changing strategy of the companies that you're working for. Are they going to change tack in terms of the industry they're in? Are they, you know, are they going to make a whole load of people redundant? Are they going to refinance because, you know, the state aid loans and the packages are going to, in the next sort of six to 12 months, not least if we don't have a second wave pandemic uh, yeah. towards the winter. So I think, you know, the Treasury 
But it needs to adapt, really. I think as a treasurer, you just need to adapt and just change and just focus on, on making sure that, you know, your boss is doesn't need to worry about cash every day. That, so you need to alternatively, if there is a problem, then it needs to be flagged. You can't you can't afford to sit at your desk and, you know, and just work away. I think uh, those days are long gone anyway with the treasurer. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. you know, you, you, you need to feel strong enough to be able to challenge your boss and the board perhaps by making them realize that if if you go along this route and you come out and, and maybe companies that come out of this and bounce back are going to have perhaps a working capital draw on the cash as revenue picks up. So, you know, looking at that cash flow profile is very key and making sure that you can see ahead, if you like, potential problems that you can then flag. So cash is king again, but sort of not the only, you know, but you've got the rest of the chessboard as well. Yes. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I'll have that one. I'll take that. That's quite good. Thank you very much. I just made that up on the hoof. It was because it is. It's 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 funny because you know I'm doing these conversations every day with treasurers, and I say, "What's your what's your hotspot, or what's the hotspot for your company?" And and all of them are different. All of them are different. Mm. Except for well, the underlying theme is you know it's, it's business capitalism. You know, it's it's you know if we don't have money coming in, money going out, we don't have a business. You know, so cash is king, but not to the degree that it's the only thing. You know, you've got to look at your FX, you've got to look at your risk, you've got to look at your staffing. You've got to, fascinating, I love it. So that's that's why I do it so much. So now Julie was amazing on our Zoom podcast or Zoom calls when we did our bounce back program. She asked some very insightful questions and, and everything else. And she gave some very good tips, I think, for people. And it sort of came out through her experience. What I wanted to do is sort of move on to a couple of tips you might have. If someone's looking at your LinkedIn profile and they're going back through and they're saying, oh, do you know what? That's a really, you know, really interesting that she's done the private equity move and Britax and, you know, you've done some other bits in there and you Woolworths and survived it and, and all that stuff. What are the, the tips you would, you know, someone sits with you and they might be college leaver, they might be a treasurer and they say, Julie, what, what do you think I should be focusing on? Or what are the three things? Or two or three things. Yeah, it's a good question. Okay, so I think first and foremost, be passionate. It's got to be something that you really want when you're going for an interview, when you're going for a job. You know, you want to try and understand whether that company is going to fit. Do you want this this role? Are you willing to learn? Because are you willing to think on your feet? Because treasury is a very varied profession. One day I could be knee deep in legal paperwork and, and deciphering clauses of debt contracts. Another time I could be building up my cash forecasting or modeling up interest rate exposures or doing a presentation for the board on supply chain. You know, so you've got to sort of be willing to learn and adapt. And I think that's sort of, sort of another point is that adapt and change as well with the environment. And also I would say that the ACT and the network that you get from the ACT and the education from 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 a association like there's others obviously out there i'm very uk biased just talking about the association group of trainers, yeah. but you know it really is you know something that come on board with and and, and the company should be supportive of you in terms yeah. of your training awesome and any others or you know do you think that's it the, the passion to you know be passionate about it because it's not going to scare you off and then you've got a variety of work that comes with it exactly i mean nobody's going to expect you to know everything hmm. and and i would say if, if i'm an interviewer then I don't expect people to know everything, especially on the on the more junior positions within Treasury. So, um, you know, you, you are getting a feel for the fact that they are passionate and willing to learn. I mean, no one is expected to know everything. I, as I said, I went to my different jobs. I mean, each and every one of them, I was like pretty clueless <laughs> from day one. Um, you know, but you learn. <laughs> That's yeah. not a top tip. Just go in and be clueless. No, it's like, no, you, no, no, you, no, you, no. No, but you've shown a passion. But as you say, that will carry you through, won't it? Because... You get it and you get treasury. That's the key thing. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Julie, fabulous, amazing, as I thought it would be. Thanks for your time today. We'll put Julie's LinkedIn profile in the show notes so you can connect to her if it's worth, you know, her having you in the network and vice versa. So, you know, as long as you're a treasury related person, she wants to be in this, she'll, she'll accept. Mm-hmm. But it's been amazing today. Thanks for your time and it'll be great fun and uh, much appreciated. No, thank you very much. 